Good morning. Um, today I'm going to talk about imaging uh, Greenland's ice from both the ground and space. And this was originally a talk that um, Chris Linder and I did at the <clears throat> Burke Museum in Seattle. And Chris was supposed to be here at a tag team today, me the scientist, he the artist. And unfortunately, well, fortunately for Chris, Chris is what I guess you'd call an expedition photographer. I've been to Greenland with him and he's just come back and he's telling me stories about being in some swamp in Africa and people toting guns and all sorts of wild stories. And then he comes up to Greenland. Someone invited him along on another big expedition that he just couldn't say no to, so he's gone. And you get me in his place. So I'm gonna try and, I'm gonna talk about the science, which I know, and then I'm gonna also try and just give you a feel for what it's like to work in Greenland. Um, so you kind of get me as a poor substitute. I'm not an artist, but I'll do my best. Um, I'm at the Polar Science Center, and actually, I'm, I'm not actually a climate scientist. I, my degrees are in engineering, um, but I learned to use um, various radars and things to measure the speed of ice. And also, engineering provides a very good um, understanding of physics and things. You need to understand the mechanics of the ice and how the ice flows and how it responds. So rather than, um, I'm sure there'll be climate questions, and I'll do my best to answer them later on, but I more try to understand how the glacier responds to climate. Um, both in terms of melting a little bit, but more so in the mechanics of the glacier and how the glacier speeds up as things warm up and the glaciers discharge more ice to the ocean. Uh, the first thing I need to do is make sure I know how to advance this. So I want to get everybody on, on the right page first before we begin because there's often a lot of um, confusion about sea ice versus glacial ice. So you probably, it, oops, I thought that was the pointer. Let's see. Okay, the pointer is down here. Um, at every September or so, usually there's a story in the paper about the diminishing sea ice and how it's, it's headed towards a new record minimum. And the sea ice is the ice in the Arctic that covers the Arctic Ocean. It freezes in place in the ocean. And it's um, only a, a few meters thick, or maybe really 20 feet or so at its thickest. And it, it expands out in the winter as, as it freezes and it retreats back in the summer. But usually, the major part, much of the North Pole around there is covered in ice, and this ice has been diminishing. This ice, though, doesn't really have any effect on sea level because when it, it's already floating, so it's displacing its, its weight in water. So uh, this very small effect that, that's trivial, that uh, minuscule, um, if you actually get into the physics, how it could potentially raise sea level, but it's, it's not significant. Um, what is significant is there's this big white reflector sitting on the Arctic Ocean. And there's what's called the ice albedo feedback. So now in the summer, a lot of energy gets reflected back into space. And as that ice shrinks um, dramatically, you have open, dark ocean that's sopping up the heat. Um, uh, and that's what a lot of my colleagues at the Polar Science Center work on. I, however, work more on glacial ice um, in Greenland and Antarctica, though I'm just going to talk about Greenland today. So um, glacial ice is much thicker. Um, uh, Greenland's about two miles thick in the middle here. And essentially it forms when um, snow falls and it piles up progressively in a big pile. If it's only a few meters thick, it's not gonna flow. But as you get it thicker and thicker and a couple miles thick, it does start to ooze and flow out. And that's what you're seeing a measurement of here is the speed of the glaciers. And it's a log scale, which means it goes in powers of 10. So the browns are the very slow moving ice in the middle of the ice sheet. And as, more, as it collects more and more snow on this big conveyor belt, it picks up in speed as it moves toward the edge of the coast. So you start to go into greens, tens of meters per year. Um, blues, sort of hundreds of meters a year. And then you get to these red, very fast moving outlet glaciers that are squeezing out through narrow fjords, like toothpaste out of a tube at, at very high rates of speeds. Um, the, the way the color saturates here, it, it, we're basically covering things that are flowing a kilometer a year or half a mile a year to things that are actually flowing um, 15 or t almost 18 kilometers a year in one of the examples I'll show you. So it's very, very fast ice. And as the ice moves towards the edge, um, it loses mass in two ways. Um, it melts, and that's traditionally people think of the ice sheets as melting away, but actually much of the mass is also lost through iceberg calving. Um, and so this leads to, to what uh, we try and measure, which is the ice sheet mass balance. It's a lot like looking at your bank account. You put money in, you take money out. Um, so we have snowfall falling on the ice sheet. And when climate's been nice and stable for a while, the ice sheet will adjust to a state where the amount of melt and the amount of iceberg calving balances things. But as climate changes, um, 
you can get more melting or more snowfall. Um, so if now we're in a situation as climate warms, we have more melting and more ice discharge and sea level is gonna rise. And going into ice ages, things get colder, there's more snow, there's less melt. Actually, there should be less snow, it's just colder, less melt. It's actually a drier climate. But essentially the ice sheets get bigger, they expand out onto the continental shelves and sea level can actually drop um, as more than 100 meters um, at times, giving rise to things like the Bering uh, Land Bridge. So again, we, we're looking at, at losses due to calving in Antarctica. Um, there's very little melting on the surface of the glacier. The ice just flows toward the ocean, where it flows out over to the ocean, and some of it, a lot of it breaks off as icebergs and floats away, or some of it melts in place in these giant ice shelves. In Greenland, um, about half the mass, roughly, is lost each year through um, calving of icebergs like this, and about half of it is due to surface melt on the surface of the ice sheet. And there's, where we go in the summers, there's lots and lots of water. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about what the impact of sea level rise is. Um, so this is what one meter of sea level rise um, would look like in, in South Florida. I mean, where we live, some of the coasts are fairly steep, so one meter might not be, have such a big impact, though there are areas where in Washington where it would have a tremendous impact. But you could see a large part of southern Florida, the Keys, and really some probably very expensive beachfront property all along Florida would be lost. A meter is sort of the upper end of what the IPCC recently projected. They projected something like um, 0.26 to 0.97 meters, um, so that's just over three feet, and pretty much in line with what's shown in this plot here. Um, there are those who think this is an overly conservative estimate and the number could actually be larger, but it's probably not going to be a lot larger than that. <clears throat> and it's not all from glaciers and ice sheets. About a third of it is due to thermal expansion. So as you warm up the top thousand meters or so of the ocean, it gets warmer and things expand when it gets warmer and actually by an appreciable amount. And currently, um, right now we're looking at about um, Three millimeters a year is the current rate, so that's about one foot per century. And depending on how you think about it, that, whether that's a lot or a little, if you live in Amsterdam or New Orleans, and it's a lot. Um, and it could easily be three times that amount. And certainly with things like um, Sandy and other events, things that normally, um, any rise in sea level brings the ocean closer to you if you're living near the ocean, and um, extreme events become that much more significant. Um, so I'm going to talk about two of our study areas today in Greenland. Again, this is the velocity map, just again showing the, the flow from the interior out into these fjords. And first I'm going to talk about Jakobsav and Ispre, which is this large glacier in Greenland. You see it sort of sticks out um, compared to the rest. And actually, there's some big ones up here, but the color table kind of hides the fact that these are moving um, only about 10% as fast as this one. This is really the fastest ice in Greenland right now and it, it delivers a tremendous amount of ice to the ocean. And I'm also going to talk about superglacial lakes. Those are lakes on the surface of the ice sheet, and I'll get into a little bit more in detail why those are important as we move along. So um, this is, I guess, the vanishing ice part um, of the talk. This whole area here, uh, here's where the glacier feeds in here and here, two branches of the glacier. Right now, this is actually right now covered by a mixture of icebergs and, and where it's frozen together sea ice. Um, it, it sort of locks up as it freezes in the winter um, and then it becomes more mobile in the summer as the, the ice floats around. But what had used to be here um, in the 90s was a 300 meter or 1,000 meter thick shelf of ice. And it, it's retreated about 10 kilometers up this fjord, and I'll show that a little more carefully in a minute. But there's a tremendous amount of ice that's been lost here, despite the fact that it actually looks icy in this picture. And so this is what the, we were just looking up from this. This is where I was showing the ice coming in, and this is that, that floating ice tongue I talked about. Um, and it was still partially in place in 2000. It had retreated a little bit up here. And I'm just, by the way, I should explain, this is um, not actually an optical image that you're used to looking at. It's actually an image made by a radar. You can actually fly a radar in space, and you can synthesize a very large antenna and get resolutions um, of a few meters. Um, 
so we can get some very high resolution images of the ice. And it's, it's a beautiful instrument for studying the ice. Of course, Greenland is dark for large parts of the year in the winter. So having a radar that can see through clouds, it can see in the dark, um, is, is tremendously important for the kind of work we do. So you can see by 2006, much of that ice shelf now, there's just this mix of icebergs like we were just looking at in the photograph. And it, it, 2007, 2008, uh, and 2009, now I cheated a little bit here because I went from a winter image to a summer image and there's a bit of oscillation that it surges forward in the winter and retreats back. But uh, now I'm gonna just show you the progression of summer images and you can see each summer it's getting, at the end of the summer, it's progressively further and further back. Um, and this is, uh, each, each summer it was losing, it's retreating back probably an extra um, 600 meters, so sort of six football fields. Um, that ice in here is acting like a big plug, like the, the cork holding the bottle of wine back. And as you remove that ice, the ice behind it wants to flow out much more quickly. And that is gonna have an effect on sea level. Um, I was advised not to use plots and talks, but I'm gonna go with this one. Um, so let me walk you through it. Um, we're looking at the Jakob 7 here. Here's a, sort of a, a map of the um, speed up here. And there's all these dots here. And at each of these dots, we plotted the speed of the glacier. So um, the red dot corresponds to the area closest to the front of the glacier that's these red dots and then yellow, magenta, green, science, and so forth up the glacier. And um, I'm mostly just going to focus on the red dots, so the fastest moving part of the ice. And it was moving at about four kilometers a year, 4,000 meters a year in the 90s, and it was pretty darn stable. It wasn't really changing. And then when we began to look at it in 2000 and 2003, um, we, uh, we actually had a gap in the data, unfortunately, here. We, others have filled in more data since then. We know actually that speed up started in this inter missing interval here. But the, the glacier started to speed up rather dramatically. And it continued to speed up going to 2004 and, and onwards. And at this point, we tended to turn the request that the satellites image these, this glacier very regularly. Um, so we don't end up with big gaps. Unfortunately, there was a transition of satellites and there was a period in 2008 where we don't have much data. But the rate of, the, there's not so much of a trend on, the, on this, during this period here. You can see that the, but there's a big seasonal variation and that's because, as I said, the glacier advances and ret um, retreats during the winter. And I actually had a video in the next slide that I think was, showed that, but I'm not sure that it's gonna play due to a, a media player incompatibility. But essentially, as it moves forward, this glacier, you could see this, um, what was looking like things were leveling off and it was, there was a big seasonal oscillation, but things were more or less level. It was a slight increase over time. And then in 2012 and 2013, the speeds took off again a lot in the summer and actually the winter speeds never came back down as slow again. And if you, um, so we started to hit something like 17 kilometers a year, which is just unprecedented in terms of glaciers on ice sheets um, in Greenland and Antarctica. There are a few glaciers in Alaska that have had surges for a very brief period that have exceeded that speed, but really this is the fastest ice sheet speeds we've seen. And if you, um, there's a lot of variation in here, but if you sort of average the, the speed for the year, it's, it comes out to, to more than 12 kilometers a year, which is three times faster than the glacier was flowing in the 90s. In the 90s when the glacier was flowing, it was more or less in balance. That means as much snowfall was coming in and melting as it was being balanced by the ice flow to the ocean. So now we're looking at you know, three times more ice going into the ocean and a lot more um, cont contribution to sea level rise. I should also just note um, sort of historically interesting thing about this glacier is it's believed to be the one that gave rise to one of the big icebergs that sank the Titanic. And if this video worked, and I don't think it will, but it shows the glacier essentially going, um, it's a time-lapse video, and it shows it rather dramatically going back um, over the course of the summer, this retreating back over this area. Um, I should also note um, that this glacier is prominently featured in the movie Chasing Ice, which is playing just down the street. If you haven't seen it, I really encourage you to see it. They, you will see some very dramatic videos of these big icebergs calving off. I mean, when one of those things tips, it's like 
many, many, many skyscrapers falling at once, and they're, they're huge events, and, and it's very impressive on the, the screen. Jim Baylog actually came up to our camp um, a couple of times, um, and I'll actually show you some uh, pictures of the canyon that I think is featured in that movie and also in the Nova episode that he did. So here's, I just wanted to sort of talk a little bit about some of the images we use, because it is just amazing um, the kinds of tools we're getting. This is a big radar image collected from many, many passes of the satellite. Um, but I'm going to show you some optical imagery, and we're very fortunate to get these data these days. Um, we actually get them courtesy of the military, because there's, I'm sure you've all looked in Google Earth, and there's a lot of high-res images now you can see. And those come from commercial satellites that um, are largely in space because the military subsidized them. And why would the military do that when they've got all these secret, super secret satellites that we aren't allowed to look at? And that's because um, when they do a press briefing and they say, these are the things we blew up overnight, they, they don't want to have to put out a secret classified image there or if they can email around these images. And they're almost as good as what they have, but they're, they don't, aren't encumbered by all the, the national security things. But the military really is only interested in a few areas, and you don't know where all those areas are. Um, they don't really care about Greenland, so there's a lot of excess capacity on these satellites, and the military essentially, um, by subsidizing them, by agreeing to buy a vast amount of data, much more than they can use. It's like having um, extra minutes on your cell phone plan, and so it doesn't cost them anything to let us sort of siphon off some of the data stream. And we're very fortunate to get that because it's, it's simply amazing data. This is looking at some of the icebergs calving off um, Jakobshavn. You can see some of them here. But they've just broken off from here. And this imagery um, goes up to something like a meter or half meter resolution. So, I mean, we can start to look down individual crevasses there. And um, it's not just great for looking at pictures. What's really great is that these images, these um, have stereo capability. So here's a pair of images, and the satellite essentially flies by the glacier, and it images it here, and then it kind of goes over here, and it looks back the other way. And um, this is sort of a little bit like one of those old stereoscope pairs they had in popular in the 1800s. And you can see the effect here. Let's see if I can. So I've just overlaid them here. Oops. Am I going? So if I go back and forth, you can see that difference. And that's merely a function of the elevation. These are only a few seconds apart, so you're not seeing the motion of the glacier. But you're essentially seeing the elevation change. And um, I have a student who's been working very intensely with these data, and he has produced these digital elevation models of the glacier, which are very accurate. They um, have resolutions of a few meters and are, are good to um, about a meter at vertical accuracy, which for many parts of the ice sheet is, is too coarse an instrument. Um, in the middle of Antarctica, for instance, you, you need a laser to measure centimeter scale changes. But for this part of the ice sheet, which is very rapidly changing, it's a great instrument because, um, I apologize, this was, the scale's not too good here, but it goes down here to 60 meters um, or about 150 feet. Um, just the change over two years on this big area of the glacier, it is actually thinned by 150 uh, feet. And that, that's a huge amount of thinning going on. And this instrument, these instruments are just incredible for being able to measure this kind of detail. In the past, we've only had um, NASA will fly a rate, uh, aircraft over these glaciers and just fly along a profile with a laser and just get a simple profile and they're kind of scattered. Now we can actually image many of these glaciers and make these kind of measurements routinely to try and track what's going on with the ice loss. And just to give you an idea of what we we're just looking at, so we're looking, this is the glacier flowing toward the ocean, so I'm going to show you a picture of the ice front here. And it's just a massive, incredibly amazing thing. You just fly over it and you're just in awe. There's, there's all of these um, amazing, huge icebergs that are, are some of them are 1,500 feet long. Uh, this is massively crevassed ice front, and this is taken from a helicopter as we were coming back from our field site, and you can just see the big calving front here. Um, 
And this is, Yac this is just not just one glacier. This is not some strange behavior, and this is some outlier glacier. Um, it, Greenland has roughly 200 large glaciers. I mean, this is the biggest one, and it is perhaps the one going the most change, but they are changing um, fairly consistently all around Greenland. Um, this is something my student Twyla Moon put together. It's, uh, it was a bit of an attempt to cram a lot of data in, in um, one figure, but it's essentially showing um, these maps of Greenland velocities at different times, and each of these dots represents one of the glaciers around Greenland. And the, the size and color of the dots indicates how much it's sped up over the different time periods she looked at, 2005 to 2010 and 2000 to 2005. And what, in addition to just the glacier speeding up, what we were struck by was the, the incredible variety of change in speed. Um, some of these dots are, are more blue shades, indicating some of the glaciers over these periods have slowed down, but many more of them have slowed up. And over the last decade or so, the average speed up is about 30%. It's a little bit look, like looking at the stock market um, where there's you know, winners up, these losers, and they're going all over the place, but the overall trend is up. And what I always find amazing about looking at this figure is when, when I started in glaciology um, in 1995 or so, someone's and mapping the speeds of these glaciers, someone said, you map these glaciers once and you're done, your career will be over because ice sheets don't change. They change on time scales of centuries. They're slow moving, they're sluggish, they're not gonna change. So um, fortunately I don't have to retire because there's so much variation going on <laughs> that it's just incredible to look at. Nobody expected glaciers, um, even uh, 10, 10, 15 years ago to be changing at this kind of, of scale. So, um, Essentially, to summarize this section of the talk, it's this, inc um, this increase in ice discharge coupled with increases in melt. Um, so the faster glaciers have really changed Greenland just from the 90s to 2010. Um, it's changed from 0.14 uh, millimeters a year to um, 0.72 millimeters a year, which maybe doesn't sound like all that much, but over the century, it, it would add up to about the amount of water that's in this glass here, which just from Greenland is a big change. And that's only with the amount of climate warming we've experienced so far. So really the concern is how much more can things speed up? And that's really what we're trying to understand at UW and how, how things will continue to evolve in the future, um, as well as how, keeping track of how they're evolving now. And Jakob Sauvin alone has raised, over the last decade and a half, has raised sea level by, on its own, a millimeter, which is, it may not sound like a lot, but when you take the ice from there and spread it all over the ocean, it, it, it's, it represents a lot, an awful lot of ice. Now I'm going to switch over to talking about um, superglacial lakes, which are these um, beautiful lakes on the surface of the ice sheet. And they are, have been great interest because um, this is a cartoon from a paper that uh, Jay Zwally at NASA published in, in 2000. And you're all familiar probably with the glaciers, you've seen the glaciers around here. And when we get melt in the summer, that melt gets underneath the glacier and it does lubricate the glacier and speeds the glaciers up. But generally, this wasn't believed to be happening on the ice sheets because they're so thick. The ice is a kilometer thick. How does the water get to the base of the ice sheet? So conventional wisdom 10, 20 years ago was there really wasn't much speed up um, until Jay noticed that there was some seasonal variation. And so we mounted an investigation to try and understand that better. And part of that was looking at these superglacial lakes, which are where we believe Mulan's form, which are these holes in the ice that go all the way to the base of the glacier through a kilometer of ice, and then lubricate it and then speed the flow. So the concern was that Greenland would go slipping much faster into the ocean. And, um, but the question was, I mean, can we really um, break, or can we get that water through a kilometer thick ice? And, and will it really have a big effect? So that's what we started out to investigate. This is one of those um, beautiful um, blue lakes and this is a canyon, I'll show pictures later, of, and you'll see featured in Chasing Ice, I believe. Um, if you've ever flown from Europe, or if you ever do fly, fly back from Europe, or to, try and sit on the side of the plane that's looking to the north, especially in, in um, uh, June and July, you'll see these beautiful sapphires dotting the ice sheet with, where these lakes are, they're about, um, couple miles in diameter often. Um, I'm gonna talk a lot about this lake and 
Actually, this smaller lake is the one I showed the picture of. This bigger one is the one we've done a lot of studies at. And each year they change a little bit. And if we look at satellite images, we do see from time to time they just disappear suddenly from one day to the next. So we were in interested in is, is this um, them draining to the base of the ice sheet. Hmm, not sure what, how that picture got in there. It's out of sequence. Um, the basic theory has been known for a long time of, of why this should happen. Um, and it's, it's not so different than some of the physics people um, use in, say, um, fracking in the oil industry. Um, it's essentially you, um, water is, is denser than ice, which is why icebergs float. But if you put water in a crack and you fill it to the brim, then the extra weight of the water will create extra pressure at the base of the crack and it'll form a wedge and the, it'll want to break through the ice. Now, if you just fill that with, and had no other source of water, but you just fill it up, it'll rupture through and crack. But once the water gets down su such that the, the um, down to about here, the, it'll equalize the pressure and it won't go any further. But if you have a lake, then you can keep that crack full, either directly underneath the lake or through one of these streams that flows into the lake and the water's just pouring in. And there is plenty of water coming out of these lakes. Um, in that case, then in theory, you should be able to hydrofracture all the way through the ice. Doesn't matter that it's half a mile thick. It'll go, it could be a mile thick. If there's enough water, you can break through there. Or at least so says the theory. So um, we went out there somewhat naively um, in, 19, in 2006. And um, we went out on, on this boat and we were um, measuring the water depth. It was about 40 feet deep. And it felt like quite a big lake when we were in the middle of it. And we put out some instruments and GPS and left the site while the lake was still full. And we found out um, when we went back that the lake had drained very abruptly in um, about two weeks later. It had fractured along a three kilometer long crack, so close to two miles long. It had drained in about 90 minutes. And if we, can we take the volume of water in the lake and calculate what was pouring to that crack, it's faster than the rate of flow over Niagara Falls. So Niagara Falls for 90 minutes. So um, as a consequence, we don't go out in boats anymore. <laughs> we, we wait till the lake has drained and, and, and these big fractures have occurred. And then we go back and um, pick up the instruments nice and dry and safe. Um, we, we had a motor on the boat and we felt we probably would have been safe, but I don't know. Some of my colleagues still have nightmares about being swirled down. <laughs> Um, and uh, this just shows a, a, a collection of data. Here's the long crack you can see um, very well in the radar image. It's about three kilometers long. These are just the inst where we had some instruments. Actually, where we had these GPS receivers, which was kind of well outside the lake boundary, the surface of the ice sheet raised up by about this much. As all that water was injected in a big sort of like blister-like thing under the ice, the ice around um, rose up and stayed that way for about 24 hours. Um, oops. And um, actually during this big block, which is um, several hundred meters long, actually um, ruptured up and it broke. It sort of fractured up and, and it was like a piece of a jigsaw puzzle that couldn't fit back in as it went back down. So um, the elevation difference measured with this um, NASA uh, laser shows that it was about this face here is about 20 feet deep, 20 feet high. And actually, I'll show some pictures later on of this. It's still there. It's, it's much more melted down and subdued now, but there's still this face right there along one of these cracks. And uh, this is, I think, me for scale. This is one of the points along here, um, somewhere in here, where there was just showing the tremendous sort of explosive power that this, when things start to rupture and, and all this water starts to break things up. There's lots of big canyons like this. And here's another, we were actually studying two different lakes, so this is the other one, and just, this just shows from the air what these sort of huge cracks look like. To put that in perspective, imagine you went walking around Green Lake in Seattle, um, and, and the time that you walked around, imagine Green Lake just drained away. And Greenland, Green Lake would actually be a fairly small lake um, by Greenland standards. But um, Green Lake's down around sea level, uh, or not much above sea level. 
So to really appreciate the way these events go, imagine a lake like this at um, Snoqualmie Pass, Summit Lodge, and Hayek. That's about the distance, the width of that lake. And imagine you put a lake there. Now we're at 3,000 feet, which is the height we're at in Greenland. Now imagine this big crack opens all the way from there between the, those two points and opens up and this lake just drains from Snoqualmie Pass all the way to the ocean. And that's the kind of thing that we're looking at in Greenland. And this happens routinely. Um, many of those lakes drain rapidly. Some of them actually drain more slowly. They, they overflow. And I'll show you the, the canyon in a second of what one of those canyons looks like. So instead of, if the crack falls beneath the lake, then the whole lake just goes whoosh. But if it's more like the, the crack can't form there, the lake will eventually overflow. And it's sort of like, um, instead of going down the bathtub drain, it's going through the overflow drain. And it goes to, it finds a crack, and then it, the water keeps feeding out of the lake all winter, summer long. Do you have any satellite photos of this happening? Um, not other than just we see one day and then the next. Um, we were by a lake when it drained one year, and it was um, very foggy. So we could see the water recede out, and we could feel the ground cracking as the, wa the water was, as it was rising up. It was sort of like this snap, crackle, pop sound, and we could hear these booms in the distance as the big crack opened, but um, we, we didn't actually see too much of it. And then there was um, one other time, and I'll show, actually the example I'm about to show, where we actually slept through it. We were going to bed. Someone said, oh, there's some noise. And someone said, oh, it's just a plane going over. We went to bed, and the next morning, the lake was gone. <laughs> and actually, that was uh, this lake here. And so there's that block again. Um, and this is um, June 15th, and it had filled up quite a bit. It's actually never quite filled as, since we've been studying it as much as that first year, because it, it got so broken up in that event that it's easier for cracks to form and um, at some point it'll all heal up and it'll probably get big again but we haven't ever got quite as big an event as we had the first time and this is only this is sorry this is june 17th so this just in a couple of days you can see quite a bit filled up and that's because in greenland we're, we're on hard ice here once the snow from the winter has melted and so the snow is sitting on the surface of the ice sheet and it's, it's getting slushy and it retains all that moisture as it's melting out. And then at some point, the sort of the slush just breaks up and all the water can quickly drain through these numerous um, streams feeding into the lake and it just tends to fill the lake up um, over the course of, of a week or two. And then boom, um, oops, boom, it drains. Um, just the very low areas here. Um, and it drained probably along this crack and then what happens with these cracks is some point along the crack, there's somewhere where, where a stream like this. This is actually not one from this drainage. It's one from the summer before. But there was a stream that kept feeding into this one point along the crack. And so the pressure of the ice, I mean, after the water's gone, the pressure of the ice closes the crack fairly quickly. But where the streams are flowing in, that water, the heat and, and the friction of the water swirl, swirling around melts the ice and is able to keep just a very small hole or a moulin open at some point along the crack, or maybe at a couple of different points along the crack. And these are, are, are really amazing features in them themselves. Um, first, I'll just show you some blow-ups of these areas. Again, this is the, uh, um, this is, uh, the, the part of the crack along there, and this is that block that, w that went up. And that's what it looks like um, when we were there after the lake drainage. And this is all snow that I think had, had been in these areas. Um, that had sort of, or snow, or uh, probably more like some lake ice. There was probably a little bit of residual water in here that had frozen. And when the big um, drainage, it kind of all got blown up and floated out. Um, and so it's just a really beautiful landscape to, to fly over and, and walk around. Um, and then this is that moulin I was talking about. And you can see these um, radial fractures here. And essentially, those are forming because the ice is gone from this area here as it's melted out. And so it's sort of this big cliff there and that creates this void means there's a lot of pressure on this face as because there's no ice to hold it back. And so it, it stretches out and produces these beautiful radial crevasses, which you can see much better here, these beautiful radial f features. There's a lot of people who work in tectonics I know and they look at these are always like, really fascinated by them. And they're quite, they're quite big features, they're quite deep. Got the helicopter pilot to fly around and really look down in them. And this is um, 
what one looks like from the ground. I think we're tricking a little bit with the perspective there. That person is, is a little ways out, so it's not quite as big as it looks, but it's still pretty amazing to stand on the edge of one of these things and look in them. And um, the stream is coming in here, and here's the water flowing in. And if I can, hopefully I can get this to start. No? Yeah, um, yeah. Oops, I guess it's the next one. Um, before I think I, yeah, there you go. And you really need a, a big subwoofer to really appreciate the thunder of these things. And some of them are quite amazing. There's ones we've, when we've been walking around, we, um, the, the stream is all melted down and it melts down over the course of the summer. So you might have this narrow slot that's, that's 20, 30, 40 feet deep. And as you walk up that slot, it's kind of like a waveguide and you can hear, it sounds like this, this thunderous roar as you approach it from that side. But if you come from the other side above the slot, you can't really hear it and you could almost, accidentally walk into it. We, you actually can hear it, but it is amazingly, um, it's just really amazing that the different way the sound plays from one side to the other. Let's see. So um, this was actually a very productive study because one of the, the last IPCC, or the fourth IPCC one, the fifth one just came out, um, they had a problem in that when they made the, um, made the, uh, the estimates, they were using ice sheet models that didn't include the physics that, or couldn't explain a lot of the large speed ups we were seeing. So they were um, overly conservative, and this is still some, a problem in that all the processes that cause ice to speed up are not fully incorporated in this, because we don't understand them all yet. We're trying to learn them, trying to make things more certain. Um, and one of the concerns was this whole idea that the water going through these lakes and the moulins would speed up the ice. and, and especially as climate gets warmer, there's more melt. So people were concerned um, that this was gonna be a big runaway effect and uh, Greenland would, um, in some sense, go slip sliding into the ocean. And what we were able to show was that lakes do in fact drain through these big fractures. It is possible to get the water there. Um, but this um, water lubricates and speeds the ice flow. With our GPS, we could see the ice speed up. Um, but it only has this relatively small influence on ice discharge to the ocean. And there's a couple reasons for this. Um, the first is that um, the big glaciers like Jakobsavn, um, well, I guess I should back up. What we see is the ice speed up by about 50 to 100 meters a year. And when people looked at the slow moving ice, they were saying it's speeding up, which is about 100 meters a year. They'd say, it's, oh, it's a 50 to 100% speed up. That's really a lot. But when we actually looked at it on the fast moving ice, the speed up was about 50 to 100 meters a year, which when the ice is moving more than 1,000 meters a year is a relatively small change. So it's really not having a big impact on the speed of these big outlet glaciers. So Greenland is not gonna go slip sliding away. The other thing um, that, that a lot of others have brought out as, as, uh, as well is that um, when the water goes, the first, when the water first gets to the base of the glacier, it does speed it up a lot. But as a lot of mountain glaciologists know, um, over time, at first everything, the plumbing is all gummed up, so you're injecting all this water and you're getting this sort of cushion that the, the glacier can slide on. But as the water gets down there and starts to melt, it melts these sort of um, conduits that can drain the glacier much more quickly. And once you get a much more efficient drainage, um, then actually the um, ice starts to slow down. So actually a lot of mountain glaciers, for example, are fastest in the spring when they first get hit. By the end of the summer, they've slowed down a lot and they're not particularly. Um, so more melt will just accelerate that process of getting a better drainage. And it, the more people have looked in our data and others' data, the more they see that it really doesn't matter if it's a high melt or a low melt summer, the amount of acceleration is the same. So one thing we have actually been able to do is really kind of check off one of these big sort of um, dramatic things that, were, that could cause the ice to go. And there's a lot, often this feeling that, that scientists are just out to hype things or to hype climate change, but the more, it seems like whatever side you believe, investigating things doesn't, it, it just removes uncertainties and it really just makes things more certain. Um, 
if the glaciers are going to do something, we'll find out, and if they're not going to do something, we'll find out. Um, most scientists that I know are actually um, fairly objective, despite some claims you hear to the contrary. Um, so now I'm going to switch over to talk a little bit more, um, and this is maybe where Chris would have stepped in, and just talk a little bit about field work in Greenland and kind of give you a feel for what it's like to go up to Greenland. And again, um, you would have gotten a much more artistic perspective from Chris, but I'll do my best. Um, so just kind of walk you through um, a little bit what a, a field trip up there is like. So the first thing we have to do is get there. And to do that, we usually go on the, with the Air National Guard, both in Antarctica and Greenland. And we go with the, um, the 109th in New York, who has um, these C-130s. And what's special about the um, C-130s that they have is that this is a ski. And so they can land in the open field in Greenland and Antarctica. And so they collaborate with the um, National Science Foundation. And it's sort of it's a nice symbiotic relationship in that we get transportation up there, and they get a chance to practice their field landings. So they fly to the South Pole. They fly all over on Greenland. And, and they, in this case, we, we landed on, a, um, on, on tarmac. But um, once when they're up there, they actually go to the center of the ice sheet. And there's some stations out there that they, they go to, both for science reasons and for their own um, practice. <clears throat> this is Sandestrom um, Base. And it's actually called Kangaluswak now. Many of the towns in Greenland have been renamed um, with the native names. And um, the first year I went up there, um, one of my colleagues went up with me. He's like, yeah, my grandfather used to come through here in World War II when they were ferrying bombers um, to, to Europe. And so that's why um, this big. Um, base was originally built in Greenland for, for ferrying these bombers. And from there, we take a commercial flight up to Alulasat, which was formerly called Jakobshavn, like the glacier. Um, and it's just an incredibly beautiful place because it sits at the mouth of that fjord. So all of those icebergs I showed you drift by, and they're just, just amazing. And, and they have this habit of painting all the houses, these really bright primary colors. It's just a beautiful place to be. So we spend a couple of days in town, typically. Um, we've shipped up a lot of gear there. We've left some stuff in storage containers. We have to pull it all out, make sure everything's good, um, make sure we have our th right food when we get up there. I do you know one uh, team that went up there one year? And this is an Italian guy who drank a lot of coffee. And unfortunately, he left the coffee at home. <laughs> so he had a couple of harsh days, I think. Um, so we've never had that tragedy occur. But um, it's just a beautiful place. It's, um, Sort of, uh, many native people live there, as do um, a lot of Danes. I think for the Danes, um, it's a little bit like Alaska for the US, so there's sort of some characters up there. And um, they, they do have these kayaks. It's, it's pretty amazing. We were there one um, day on the solstice, and they had a, a, a big celebration. It was a national holiday there. And they were all, um, I'm probably being politically incorrect, but doing Eskimo rolls, for lack of a better term, in the bay and with ice floating all around them. And another time we were up there, we saw a guy out there teaching his, his son. And he's out there doing this. And then the kid gets out, and he's just this skinny little kid in like sh jeans and a t-shirt. And he'd been out in this freezing water. It's just incredible. Um, but there's just other odd sights, too. There's all sorts of old cars and things around town against this backdrop of icebergs. And sled dogs, they, the Greenland Huskies. Um, at one point, Alulisat, which has about 5,000 people, had more Huskies than had people. <laughs> and that was in the 80s when um, the sea ice was much more extensive in Disco Bay. And they would take these Huskies out to Disco Island, both for hunting and things. But also, um, I think a lot of Danes like to come up, and Europeans like to come and do, um, you know, pay for a sled dog ride. So these guys are all over town, I think. Their numbers have declined. There may be only about 3,000 there. And actually, the last time I was there, it seemed to me, I don't know if they've moved them to the outer parts of town more or if they just really are becoming less and less, because um, they do eat a lot, so they're expensive to maintain. Um, but the little guys are allowed to roam around freely, but all of the others, at some age, I don't know, six months or something, they get staked to the gr with a big chain around there, because they are, um, they're, they're not all domestic family dogs. They're working dogs. So um, event, once we get all our gear packed up and, and, and we have to um, figure out precisely 
they give us a certain amount of weight we can put on the helicopter. It typically takes two or three flights, so we have to do this thing where we balance the load properly at the same time making sure the first people who go out have food and coffee and such and in case the weather comes in and the helicopter can't come back that day. So we have one of the most beautiful commutes uh, to work on that. We, we fly over the fjord with these beautiful icebergs. And just the geography up there is incredible. Um, somehow this clicker doesn't always respond. Uh, this is that lake I showed you earlier, and it actually, this lake has not drained for a few years. Um, and so it still has this layer of ice that it formed over the winter. And that's because the canyon I'll talk about, um, actually this is a new version of the canyon that's starting to open and the lake is beginning to flow over it. Um, but the, the ice is continually moving along, so a canyon may be there um, for a few years and drain the lake, but as it slides up and over the hill, it arises above the level of the lake and it can't drain that anymore. It's um, processes like the Grand Canyon and things like that with plate tectonics that you would see over millions of years, you can see in a few years in Greenland. It's, it's really fascinating from that perspective. Um, we go in a, one of these uh, helicopters, which is a, um, uh, it's, it's a Bell 222, I think, 212, Bell 212, which is essentially, if you watch a Vietnam movie, you'll see one of these painted green. It's essentially the same helicopter. And we set up a camp. This is a typical camp. We have one or two of these tents that are kind of common tents for cooking and eating in. And then we each have um, a mountain tent like that um, to sleep in. And there's usually four to six people with us. This was a uh, particularly tough year because normally we go out um, and all of the snow is melted off, so we're on bare ice. It's very easy to walk around. And um, this particular year, it was a combination, and we went a little earlier than normal, and um, the snow was late that year. So this is all slush. And the surface around there, there's lots of little like ditches, like streams, that um, are easy to walk over when it's bare. But what happens is the, the water from the melting snow all um, gets in there. So this is just this big slush swamp that's with a, with a little bit of snow on top. So you can quickly plunge your, your rubber boots in through and, and get wet feet um, uh, pretty dramatically. So that's what this cardboard is sort of a, a bridge to get back and forth to where we keep the fuel and other things. Um, this would be about June 20th. What's the temperature? Um, we're, we're essentially sitting on a big block of ice, and so it's usually a, the, the fact that the ice will melt as it gets warmer, so it kind of keeps it at, at just above freezing. Um, and, but it's sunny, it's, it's never cold. I mean, I feel colder walking around outside today in the dark. <coughs> cloud-covered area. This is sort of what one of our, our tents looks like from the inside, the, the cooking tent, so we cook here. And believe it or not, we can actually fit six people in here. It's fairly cramped. Um, unfortunately, the tents tend to cover the ground, so the, the ice is actually melting down a few um, centimeters a day. Actually, at this particular camp, there's about five feet of melt each year. That doesn't mean the ice sheet's losing uh, height that quickly because the ice from upstream is flowing in to replace it. Um, uh, by and large, um, um, but as it melts down, the, the edges that are kind of exposed to the air and the sun tend to melt, so you kind of get this, the sides kind of go down like that, and sometimes by the end of the trip, you're in, the, you're in, your, in your sleeping tent and you're just like over this rack kind of thing, everything's bent over, and there's not a lot of flat spots to find to begin with, so it's hard to necessarily move the tent, so people keep sort of moving their chairs toward the center, and it gets rather crowded by the end of the trip. Um, so the main thing usually we're out there to do is maintain our equipment. So um, this particular season we had something like 20 GPS receivers out around the lakes. We were trying to understand once the earlier part of the study we established that the cracks form and now we're collecting data to um, uh, used to constrain a model of, of a fracture opening. So we want to um, have lots of GPS. So we had about 20 <clears throat> out there. And we had to maintain them. Um, when we go back, they often look like this because the melt's pretty high. This was probably sunk in something like 10 to 15 feet. And it was probably there for a couple years. And it's just melted out that much. So we find them like that usually. We sort of tear them all apart, make sure everything's still working. 
Um, uh, this clicker doesn't always click. Um, and then um, re-drill them back in, and there's, they will go in about 15 feet by the time this drill bit gets pulled out, it's really high. And we leave them looking nice and neat like this. And when we leave and they sit there over the winter and collect data, actually sometimes, some of them have more batteries so they will collect data over the winter and some of them were mostly interested in this summer season. So um, they just essentially turn off when the um, sun goes down. Unfortunately, they don't always come back on in the spring. So this year we actually went up in May and July so we could make sure they were all turned on in May. Um, Oops, and we also put things like, this is, uh, these are pressure transducers that sit in the lake, so they measure the pressure, and so when the lake fills up, you can get uh, an estimate of the depth of the lake. Um, but we leave them out, and sometimes we might not be back there for a year or two, and the ice is moving, the water can swirl them around, so Sarah was very happy when she located this um, set of instruments here after we all walked around on this sort of big Easter egg hunt looking for these things. Um, another thing we do when we're there is we just go exploring because you look at satellite images and you can see things but you don't necessarily understand how everything works. And I'm always amazed that, well I've seen plenty of earth scientists make um, hypotheses about what they're seeing in images and then they turn out to be wrong when they actually go there. And I'm always amazed at how the Mars scientists look at all these images and come up with all these theories but no one's ever going to go there and tell them they're wrong or at least not before they retire. So we do walk around and we try and look at these features. We stare down cracks, we look down holes, um, we watch melt streams, we try and understand how it works. Um, our camp is actually uh, a few kilometers back that way. We range far and wide and often in the evening because we spent the day doing receivers. So um, things like this canyon, when we first discovered it, um, in uh, maybe 2007, it was still active and draining water, and we got there at about midnight, and it was just this beautiful, the sun is very low on the horizon, this beautiful light. This is more in the sort of high noon time of day. Um, this is the one that, that is, was featured in National Geographic, um, one of Jim Balog's photos, and I think is pretty sure it's shown in the Chasing Ice movie. It certainly was in the Nova episode. Um, we were there when they shot, they came up there for Nova, and they rappelled down this face here. Um, it's kind of interesting to watch them do that. Um, on the smaller scale, there's a lot of beauty too. I mean, this is actually probably, it's hard to get sense of scale, but it's probably only about 30, 40 feet across here. This is just a bend in a small melt stream. But some of the times it can just be startlingly, startlingly beautiful when you look at it. And uh, you know, these are cryaconite holes. Um, the dust that's collected on the ice sheet over thousands of years as the ice is melting out tends to collect and it, it, it tends to kind of collect together and then the sun melts, sees this dark dust and it melts these holes down which are, get the whole surface of the ice is sort of Swiss cheesy effect and Chris has some beautiful shots looking down at the ice freezing on those. Actually here are several more of these things. This is actually where the lake had drained and so the the, the hole is in this, the Krakenites, they, they're about this deep and they initially kind of more like a post hole or straight down. But when the water from the lake is there and it's swirling around and melting things, it tends to make them look more like an egg carton um, by the time they're finished, which makes actually walking um, across the lake surface sometimes really treacherous because especially after it's just drained and the ice is, is still um, slippery and wet. After it's been exposed to the sun for a while, it cracks and things and it's, it's not very slippery. We, we don't really typically wear crampons. Um, but right after drainage, this stuff is really a pain to walk on. And it's just, just this beautiful landscape. Um, I mean, it's just amazing to wake up in the morning. We camped right beside some of the lakes sometimes. And you, it's like being on another planet. Um, white with blue, blue, um, blue lake, it's incredible. So at some point we finish up our work. Uh, this is often the most stressful part of the trip because we've just spent a few hours breaking down camp. And it is not uncommon for the helicopters. It, it can be beautiful up on the ice sheet and it's fogged in down in, by the water. And so the helicopters uh, need to fly by visual flight rules so they can't fly. Or sometimes it's um, really low clouds up here and the helicopters can't fly because you get absolutely no horizon and they need to have a good horizon to land. So there's always the stress of once we packed up, are they gonna come and get us? Are we gonna have to put it all together, back together? And while it, when we needed them to come out and do day work, they've 
often missed, we've actually not ever had a problem on the pullout, but you're always worried because often you've got a flight back home and you, you, you don't want to have to tell your wife you're not coming back for a few more days. Um, we really crammed those helicopters full. It's a little easier coming out because they burned off a big part of their weight and fuel um, coming out to, to get us. So they're not so concerned about the weight as, as when they're flying with a full tank out to the ice. And when we get back in town, um, we have a couple days before we go to wrap up, and that's when we also have time to be tourists. So we often um, had fairly in inexpensive um, trips out onto the water in these, these little boats to go around the icebergs and see them up close. They're often piloted by Santa Claus, who's <laughs> actually quite a grumpy guy. <laughs> but he's one of the, actually the better ones to go out on because he'll actually, for better or worse, go closer to the ice than some of the other um, captains. But these, the icebergs out in the bay are, are just incredibly beautiful. Um, they're just, just amazing. And um, just, they tend to, a lot of times you see these arches form where I think they kind of melt out at the water line and then the ice sort of collapses inward. And these, thing, these things are really big. I mean, you can imagine why an unsinkable Titanic runs into one of these and it, it actually um, sinks. It doesn't win. And then um, the tours are typically like 10 to midnight. So um, we're in the land of the midnight sun and usually I think the first sunset's around July 23rd and that's a, typically when we're pulling out. So often the sun is just skirting the horizon. And so by 11 or 12 o'clock at night, you just get these beautiful light on the ice and it's just um, really amazing to be out there. And then we go home and <laughs> come back to Seattle. Um, and that's, that more or less wraps up the, the talk. And um, I'm happy to field questions for as long as you have them.